Okay, welcome to Trace Material Live with Chris Maurer from Red House Studio. I'm Ava Robinson, and this is my co-host, Burgess Brown. This is the first event of our spring event series, Mycelium Millennium. We're going to officially start the live taping um, here shortly, but if you haven't been to one of our events before or are unfamiliar with our work at Healthy Materials Lab, we wanted to take a moment to introduce ourselves. So Healthy Materials Lab is a design-led research lab here at Parsons School of Design at the New School. And we're dedicated to placing people's health at the center of all design decisions. Now, what that means in practice is that we raise awareness about toxics in our built environment, and we're working to make healthier alternatives more accessible and popular. We do this work with explicit focus on those designing, building, and living in affordable housing, because all people deserve healthier interior environments. One of the ways we're raising awareness about toxics in our environments is our podcast, Trace Material. We hope you've been listening, but if you haven't, each season we trace the history of a particular material. In our most recent season, called Stories from the Plastics Age, we looked back at all of the ways plastics has reshaped our culture, our bodies, and our environment over the last century. And now we're excited to look forward what will define our next material age? One possibility is mycelium. And we're excited to announce that the next season of Trace Material is going to be dedicated to a deep dive on all things fungi. We'll talk more about the upcoming season at the end of the event, but keep an ear out this summer for new episodes. Today, we're going to head straight to the mycelial deep end with Chris Maurer, who we'll introduce in just a minute. Uh, but first, we should officially start the show, right, Ava? Yes, absolutely. And that really just means we're going to hit play on our theme song and repeat a little bit of what we just said, but this time on tape. Quick note before we do that, we've got the Q&A open and also the chat open, but please make sure that you put any questions you have for Chris or I or, and Burgess in the Q&A and not the chat. Um, when we get to the Q&A section, we'll be just reading from the Q&A, not from the chat. You can also upvote questions there. Um, so if somebody has already asked a similar question, just go ahead and hit that little thumbs up um, and then they'll bring the most upvoted questions to the top of the Q&A box. Um, so yes, I think that's it. Are we ready, Burgess? Let's roll the theme song, Ava. All right, welcome to another edition of Trace Material Live. Today, Burgess and I are joined by the founder and principal architect at Red House Studio, Chris Maurer. We're excited to talk to Chris because his work focuses on every stage of a building's life cycle, from material development to disposal and reuse. Chris has developed an expertise in working in limited resource environments that has led to projects across three continents and even off planet. He is committed to the utilization of biotereals in his projects, chiefly mycelium, which is the root-like network of fungi. To share, uh, to share stories of these three projects he's working on and that make use of fungi as a biorecycler, a food source, and the building blocks of housing. Chris, thanks so much for joining us. Um, so as we're looking at your work, it seems to really be defined not so much by what you build, but what you build with. Um, so I think it'd be helpful to start with the materials that you're exploring in your practice. Can you explain for us the term biotereals and how they're different from terms we might be more familiar with, like maybe biomaterials or bio-based materials? Yes, thank you for that question. I, I usually like to start my talks um, defining biotereal. Um, a lot of folks use the word biomaterial when they're talking about um, some of the things that I'll be speaking about today. Uh, but when you look at the definition for biomaterial, you'll see that it, it has to do with things that work well with biology. So in medicine, that includes things like titanium and plastics that are used in surgery. 
Um, another term that comes up a lot is bio-based materials, and these are, you know, mat uh, th uh, materials that usually are made of biomass harvested at the end of their life cycle. So think here of wood or bamboo that come from trees or grasses um, that have been cultivated for uh, material production or harvested from nature. Uh, they are grown and then harvested and then processed into materials. So with uh, biomaterials, it, it's something else. And, and we define that as a material that utilizes the growth of an organism or organisms in its manufacture. Um, so here the growth is integral to the making of the material. Uh, it's often grown in place or in situ. Um, and some examples of uh, these types of materials include uh, materials made from bacteria that are grown to make calcite to replace cement, uh, fungi that have root-like branching hyphae, hyphae that weave together other biomass into a dense composite, or a combination of those two, uh, bacteria and fungi together uh, can form a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. Um, this is known to kombucha enthusiast as a SCOBY. Um, bacterial formation processes that can replace cement are co commonly referred to as MICP, or microbial induced calcite precipitation. In the same way coral makes structures from calcite, so can bacteria. And when researchers and biofabricators leverage that ability, they can make bricks and blocks. A company called Biomason, based in North Carolina, is beginning to commercialize bricks made from this MICP process. And they claim that their process not only eliminates the heat and cement needed to make brick and block respectively, but the metabolic process absorbs carbon dioxide as well. Uh, calcite is a very uh, common form of calcium carbonate that makes limestone. Um, so this is a natural process that actually makes stone and the biofabricators are doing this in a lab. And sometimes I, I wonder if there, if this isn't actually an ancient technology that the, you know, Egyptians used to make the pyramids in situ just to baffle us millennia later, uh, asking how they move, move those huge blocks. Um, so another, another version of this is kingdom fungi. Um, this is of course the, the one that I primarily work with. Uh, fungi include uh, yeasts and mushroom forming organisms and many uh, fungi have root-like branching hyphae called mycelium. Um, and mycelium is the vegetative form of, of fungi that consists of root-like branching hyphae. And when you look at them, uh, you, you, you can kind of see that parallel. They do look like roots. Um, but it's it's really kind of a, the wrong way to look at it. If you um, compare the the roots of the mushroom to the roots of the tree, um, it's a little bit opposite uh, because the the mushroom is really the fruit of the mycelium. So the mycelium itself is the organism, and the uh, fruit of the that organism is the um, is the mushroom. There are uh, several companies that are commercializing mycelium technology right now, including Ecovative Design that is revolutionizing uh, packaging material uh, with biotereal made from mycelium and agri-waste that, that can replace expanded polystyrene, uh, which is commonly referred to as styrofoam, and a company called Microworks that is creating vegan uh, leather goods that are currently being used by Stella McCarthy and others. Awesome, thank you so much. So many of those companies were fans of um, Biomason we've spoken with before and Michael Works we're going to be speaking with later this uh, next month. So it's exciting to hear those shout outs. Uh, can you tell us about your journey uh, toward working primarily with biomaterials? Uh, I've spent a lot of time working in the developing world. I lived and worked in Malawi and Rwanda for a number of years as an architect and office director at both Studio MDA and Mass Design Group. Those experiences have taught me well what it's like to work in limited resource environments. It, it occurred to me upon returning to the you know, overdeveloped world that we should always be in the mindset, in this mindset because we are always working within limited resources. It's just not as apparent here where lumber and concrete mix is readily available 
Uh, of course, with supply chain issues and rising costs, we're all starting to see that to some extent, but not really. We're, we're still using carbon emitting materials and we're still clearing rainforests at record pace. Um, when I first came across mycoterials, I was amazed. And myco mycoterials are a type of bioterial that use fungi in their manufacture. It's usually uh, the mycelium that does the work. Uh, remember the root like branching hyphae that bind together the different substrates to form strong composites. Uh, in this case uh, of mushroom forming fungi, here's a process that we can take waste resources and convert them into food and building materials that are strong, insulative, fire resistant. And you know, my media re reaction to this was this would be a perfect process for creating dignified housing uh, for climate refugees. These are the 200 million uh, people that may be displaced annually due to climatic events directly attribute to anthropogenic climate change by mid-century. Um, here's a way to provide housing, jobs, food security, all the things that refugees need in the shelter um, that could be safely composted at the end of life if the camp needs to migrate. Amazing. Um, so today we're going to focus on three of your projects that are happening at different scales and in very different places, but maybe we should start close to home for you in Cleveland. Yes, as a Clevelander, the, the BioCycler project, uh, which recycles and remediates blighted homes, is our mica texture that's closest to home. Uh, I should say that it also hits closest to home to me as an architect as well. I see in, in my projects uh, prodigious waste, amounts of waste that uh, construction and demolition or C&D waste that go to landfill. In landfill, those materials get mixed in uh, into a tainted biomass and they emit greenhouse gases. They can also poison groundwater supplies because unfortunately we have a nasty habit of putting toxins into, the, into building materials like petrochemicals and uh, very notably heavy metals like lead, um, also cadmium and arsenic. Uh, what BioCycler does is not only recycles that C and D waste, thereby diverting it from landfills, but it also remediates it. Fungi have the natural ability to break down petrochemicals like bitumen and asphalt and C and D waste by enzymatic action. Uh, when it comes to heavy metals, that's a little bit of a harder nut to crack, but because they can't be broken down, what happens is those particles become lodged in the cell wall of the mycelium, which is primarily made of chitin. And chitin is a strong natural polymer that makes up the exoskeletons of insects and crustaceans. Uh, we also use biochar uh, that attracts and binds these uh, trace elements, making them biologically unavailable. Um, we're finding that this binding and uh, sequestra sequestration lasts beyond the material's life. And even when they're landfilled, they do not leach as the toxins the same way the normal C and D waste does, which can prevent those toxins from entering uh, water streams. In Cleveland, we have a glut of abandoned homes. There are commonly thousands of homes slated uh, for demolition, and most of them are poisoned with lead. Our children have incidences of lead poisoning that is four times the national average. Uh, we have much more here than in Flint, Michigan. In Flint, it was famously the water that poisoned the population. Here in Clint, or here in Cleveland, it's our crumbling infrastructure. Um, we're not alone in this. There are thousands of thin thinning cities that are struggling with children being poisoned at home. Um, the way that industry, banking, and manufacturers have colluded over the year, over the decades, to pass the worst effects of their dealings to marginalized communities, it's clear why um, communities of color bear the brunt of these sins. So we see this, uh, we see environmental justice as a core feature to the bio cycler. Um, and we, we want to address um, the, the work that is uh, focused on and powered by these communities. Um, that's why we're working with uh, black environmental leaders in Cleveland and concerned citizens organized against lead and other uh, MBEs and community development groups to make sure that the community stakeholders are forefront in bringing this technology to fruition. 
Uh, we've built a, a very small shed using the BioCycler to date. So, you know, it's pr still pretty small scale. Uh, but what we did is we reclaimed uh, demolition material and uh, made a wooden shell from the lumber. And the interior, we made panels that were biocycled from the waste from processing this lumber. The interior panels have artistic impressions on them made from metal filings on the surface of the mycelium, which gets absorbed into the metal, uh, gets in, absorbed into the biomass. This is kind of an artistic way to, to represent the subsurface process, uh, processes that are binding and sequestering the heavy metals. That is so cool. <laughs> Those images are so amazing. Um, and I, I love that the biocycler is entirely fueled by waste. This genesis and waste is a theme for your projects. Can we head across the, uh, the, across the globe to Namibia and talk about a different kind of waste problem there? Yeah, circular economy and waste resource utilize, utilization is a main theme in our work. Um, in Namibia, we're using uh, the encroacher bush, uh, which is a biomass waste from bush thinning that com combats desertification as a substitute for um, substrate for food production and the waste from the mushroom farming to create the building material. So it's waste two times over. From uh, one pound of waste bush, we can get one pound of food and one pound of building materials. It kind of sounds like magic, but my colleague Andreas from MIT is a physicist and assures us there's no laws of conservation uh, being broken there. The extra mass is literally pulled from the air and from water um, in the same ways that the, the trees create biomass from the air and sunlight fungi can convert biomass using air and water. Um, there's also an incredible amount of carbon that can be stored in this process for all the ills of the encroacher bush. They choke uh, wildlife refuge, they dry up groundwater, they can lead to desertification. At least they absorb carbon dioxide throughout their, um, throughout their life cycle. And uh, we can actually pull that, uh, the, the material that gets pulled from the atmosphere can get stored in the building materials and it can uh, uh, be sequestered for at least the life of the building when we make building materials out of this. Uh, the, the resulting material after we've done this, you know, two-step process of growing mushrooms and, and creating the blocks is about 43% carbon. And when you multiply that with the, by the CO2 equivalency, it means for every 10 kilogram block, uh, we store about 15 kilograms of carbon dioxide. Uh, right now, the, uh, the mushroom farm is, is operational. The crop yields um, from the encroacher bush are very good. We're currently growing oyster mushrooms that are sold at supermarkets and used at hotels. Uh, the proceeds from the mushroom sales are subsidizing uh, building homes for families experiencing housing insecurity. Uh, the blocks we're making now have compressive strengths similar to concrete block. We've tested the materials here in Cleveland that have strengths of 26 megapascals, which is twice as strong as concrete block. Uh, we have a GIF, um, uh, that, that you can probably see on our, our website or our Instagram feed uh, that is uh, of our colleague Penda, one of the site managers smashing our block with a sledgehammer next to him smashing a concrete block with a sledgehammer. Uh, it's not as scientific as the tests we do at, at MIT or Stanford, but it's very illustrative of the impact resistant of the material. The concrete block shatters into hundreds of pieces and the micro block uh, just gets uh, some small cracks and actually kind of bounces in the whole process. Um, once the demonstration project is up in Namibia, we hope to scale this by a factor of 10 or so, uh, where the mushroom farming creates export goods that are higher value um, than the block production and we could build hundreds of um, hundreds of biohabs. We've calculated that if we use less than 1% of the biomass in Namibia, um, that the Namibia wants to thin from the encroacher bush, uh, we could house the 25% of the population who are currently living in shacks and informal settlements in the next 15 years. This could also create um, 2 million tons of mushrooms and uh, 3 to 5 million tons of carbon dioxide could be stored in this process. Wow. 
those are some incredible, incredible numbers. Um, Chris, we, a couple slides back, we saw a GIF, I think of like an inflatable form work. Could you tell us a little bit about what happens once these blocks are made and how they're assembled into housing? Absolutely, yeah. So we, we, we didn't start stop innovating with just the, the building materials. We've actually uh, developed a few different ways of, of uh, building that, that's a little bit different than the norm. We've uh, created these inflatable form works that, that can actually, uh, um, you know, do be the centering for the arches as they, they get built. Um, and they can be used over and over and over again. Uh, whereas it, when, when you do arch structures or dome structures, usually the, the form work used to create that is just as much building material as the, the end product. And, and you create a lot of waste by, by doing that. So with our inflatable structures, and, and we originally developed this for, for another project um, that we're doing uh, off planet, but this, this uh, was brought here to, uh, for, for this reason, just to save um, to, to save the uh, the building materials needed for constructing it. So in that um, animation uh, or in that time lapse, you can see us putting up the the formwork for the uh, for the structure. It uh, takes less than an hour to put this up, whereas uh, normal uh, formwork may take days. And um, not to mention that you can uh, you know put, use this over and over and over again, uh, whereas the um, the, the, the typical formwork starts to deteriorate over time. And I know you just got back from, from Namibia, from visiting, visiting site. Can you tell us sort of where, where things are with this project right now, what stage we're in? So we're, we're currently building the, the demonstration structure. So that, that's the, the, you know, the biohab number one. I suppose you would call it. Um, we have the, the mushroom farm is operational. The, the, the mushrooms are going to, to market. We're producing, you know, roughly 100 blocks a day. Um, you know, it's, it's a mechanized process. We have a, a, a fairly robust staff, but it's, um, you know, it's nowhere near where it would be a commercial commercial project to um, um, to, to, to solve, you know, thousands of uh, tons of material per day. But what what we're doing um is creating the blocks that we need for for the first structure and this is kind of a demonstration that should lead to a, a scaled project we hope to scale this to you know by a factor of 10 in the next uh, year or so and then um uh, take it to other countries um shortly after the, the the process scales in namibia the the main benefactor for this uh project is standard bank group they're based in south africa and they work in uh, 20 uh, plus sub-Saharan African countries. Um, and so, uh, you know, everyone's kind of on, on a list right now for, for getting biohab number two or three. Um, but I think we'll, we'll shortly be working in South Africa and uh, possibly uh, intercontinental um, shortly after that as well. Amazing. Um, so we've now seen uh, mycelium at work in some of your projects in Cleveland and in Namibia, and we sort of teased it at the beginning, uh, but you've got some pretty far out ideas for off-planet uses for these materials. Could you tell us about that? That's that's right, yeah. If you, if you recall, I, I originally thought of uh, this for the climate refugee uh, for this technology, but it soon grew from there. I presented this idea at a biomimicry conference uh, hosted by NASA. And an astrobiologist there, Dr. Lynn Rothschild, thought it would be a brilliant way to develop off-planet habitats. Of course, here's a, a great example of a limited resource environment. Um, and we presented this idea to NASA headquarters, and we were awarded a NIAC prize for developing. That's, uh, that's uh, NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts. And uh, we're currently in their second phase of the NIAC program, and we're prototyping self-growing habitats uh, for NASA here in Cleveland. Um, and Lynn's based in um, uh, Silicon Valley at um, NASA Ames. Um, that, I was later presenting that project, uh, the, you know, the off-planet concept uh, at another NAF NASA conference, and a co-presenter there who liked the idea asked why we couldn't do this on Earth. I said, of course we could. Um, but we we're not funded for that concept yet. So that other presenter was uh, Andreas Mershon at, at uh, MIT. At the, he's the director of label-free research. And we decided then and there to, um, 
uh, that we would co-found a company and called Mycohab with uh, Standard Bank Group, and we're bringing that idea to life in Namibia, as you just saw. So I sometimes joke that that Mycohab, the Mycohab concept, took a detour to Mars before before landing uh, in Namibia. But um, one of the things that makes this really fantastic for uh, for NASA is this. Um, idea of being able to grow something at destination really saves a lot of mass and transport. Um, so we usually use the analogies of um, you can either be like a turtle and take your home with you when you travel, uh, which of course buys reliability, but it's going to cost you uh, energy. And that's that's why turtles and tortoises are, are famously very slow. Uh, the other option is you can be like a bird um, and you can build your home when you get to destination. Um, and that's that's the concept NASA calls uh, in situ resource utilization or ISRU. Um, what we propose is something in the middle of the, the road of that, which is basically you would take a uh, preceded bag of uh, biology. That biology would be met with rovers at destination that could provide water and carbon dioxide and nitrogen, all the things that would it take for autotropic organisms like algae to grow that algae would provide the biomass uh, that then we can use mycelium to uh, to pair with to create this these composite materials that are very similar um, to what we're doing in Namibia and here in Cleveland. Uh, the, the, the sealed bag has to do a lot of the work though. It, it actually becomes almost like an organism in itself because it ha has to have things like uh, air transport and nutrient transport and water transport. So there's, you know, these cells that, that, that grow with the material, but they are combined, or they're, they're connected by this circulatory system that provides all of those nutrients the same way that we have circulatory systems that do that. Um, that could also work uh, for the, the furniture as well. Um, not only can the structure be made that way, but the interiors uh, could be, all of the furniture can be grown because, you know, as you'll, you'll see in other lectures or we've mentioned with companies like uh, Microworks or Milo. Um, there are leathery like materials that can be made from mycelium. There are very soft materials like padding uh, that can be made from uh, mycelium composite too. So almost anything within the, the dwelling itself could, could be made from biotarials. Um, we, we mentioned a through line of uh, waste resource utilization and here, you know, obviously we don't have a waste uh, biomass. We have to create it ourselves through the creation of the autotrophs, but what we do have a whole lot of um, in, in space is ionizing radiation. So once you get past the Earth's magnetic shield, um, there's, there's ionizing radiation, including high powered ultraviolet. Um, X-rays, gamma rays, um, and even more dif difficult to deal with is the particle radiation or subatomic particles that are being blasted through space and star ejections and explosions. Um, fortunately, biology may have a way to deal with some of this too. There are fungi that can transduce this ionizing radiation into benign forms of energy and even convert them into biomass. It's a process called radiosynthesis. And uh, researchers first discovered this when they were looking into uh, fungi that was proliferating near Chernobyl after the fallout. It, it, it was even growing uh, directly on the reactors. Um, radiosynthesis is similar to photosynthesis, which also converts radiation into biomass, but this is at a whole different level. And strangely from a kingdom that does not normally produce food like autotropic uh, plants do. Yeah. But by utilizing these radiotropes, we may be able to leverage NASA's biggest liability for space travel, that's, that's ionizing radiation, as a resource for material production. Not only are these uh, fungi able to transduce the high energy radiation, but they might also be able to protect us from them. Uh, most researchers in the field think the key element of that protection is melanin. And melanin is a biochemical that exists in all kingdoms of life, uh, it's what humans use to protect our skin from UV damage. Uh, mel melanin can scatter radiation. It can scavenge free radicals. It uh, can continue to work uh, in living or non-living material. Uh, so we don't necessarily have to keep the materials alive in the building sh um, shells. Most, most materials that we build up uh, 
are in fact dead. <laughs> a lot of people like their materials that way, but um, the m melanin continues to um, provide this uh, shielding effect even uh, once the, the material that they've grown in becomes inert. Uh, we might also be able to use the, um, the, the bioaccumulating aspects of mycelium uh, to, to incorporate other radiation attenuators. Uh, I mentioned before in the biocycler, that lead becomes uh, lodged in the cell wall of mycelium, and lead exists in Martian regolith or soil. Um, so we might be able to mine that resource uh, through mycoaccumulation. We we sent a few um, samples up to the um, International Space Station, and they were actually on the outside of the space station for for over six months. And both the um, uh, sun side, which they call the zenith, and the earth facing side, which they call the wake. Um, to see what the effects are of, you know, space radiation, of atomic oxygen, um, of the huge uh, shifts in temperature, um, because, you know, once you come around to the sun, it gets very hot, and then when you go to the, the dark side of the earth, um, the materials become very cold. So they have several hundred degrees temperature shifts, like 14 times a day. So it's, it's like really speeding up a, uh, you know, weathering process. Uh, the, the materials came back um, and they were uh, they're in great shape. Uh, we're doing all kinds of um, microscopy and spectroscopy on the materials right now. Folks at NASA Glenn, folks at uh, Johns Hopkins and uh, University of Akron are all doing uh, lots of experiments on the materials to see how well they actually absorb from the radiation. But um, when you compare uh, the biomaterials in, th in terms of compressive strength and modulus of elasticity, in R value, temperature to produce, the radiation protection, all of those things, when you add those up, they go head to head with any of the other ISRU um, uh, proposed materials that NASA is working with. And this is the one that you can actually, um, you know, grow at destination. Wow, yeah, just incredible. Um, so uh, this has been so fascinating and uh, I think that our, our audience would agree with me because we're getting a lot of great questions coming into the Q&A uh, portion that I think will allow us to con continue to kind of expand on what you've just presented, Chris, it's amazing. Um, so I think let's go ahead and start uh, the Q&A portion of this and just kind of continue the conversation here. Um, so a reminder that if you have questions for Chris, please go ahead and drop those in the Q&A section, not the chat, so that people can upvote. And if you haven't taken a look at what's already in the Q&A section, go on over there and start upvoting. We're just going to go in order of which questions have uh, have the most upvotes. So um, Ava, do you want to start us off with the first question here? Yeah, absolutely. So this one is pretty popular. Um, mm -hmm. How can we source these materials or find more resources on how to make them? Uh, so th there are a bunch of DIY type forums for, for making uh, make your own biomaterials. Uh, Ecovative uh, design that I mentioned as a, a leader in the packaging um, replication world, they, uh, they have a, a uh, GIY, they call it, grow your own material, or GYI, grow your own material. Um, they sell through a, a few different companies, some of their licensees. I think Grow Bio is one of them. Um, so, so there are a lot of um, you know do-it-yourself type kits that you can you can make biomaterials. Uh, we have some stuff online that, that that we're happy to share with uh, you know our processes. Um, one of the things that are they're different about how we grow and, and folks like Ecovative and, and other um, uh, material uh, manufacturers are, is we try to do both things. We try to make mushrooms and we make uh, materials from the waste of the mushroom cultivation. A lot of times, you know, getting to the perfect material in manufacturing uh, would forego the whole mushroom uh, creating um, uh, part of that because you, you'd get a, a much uh, finer or more refined material um, just by growing the mycelium uh, uh, completely the way you want to. Um, we think, you know, you might be leaving some some money on the table or some pizza in the box or, you know, however you want to say it. Uh, you might be missing an opportunity by not having the mushrooms. 
Um, and, you know, since our goal is about food security and building security at the same time, uh, with a lot of our projects that, that we, we do both, both of those processes, I should say with the biocycler, we don't, um, do mushrooms because, uh, in that case, the mushrooms could be contaminated with, um, some of the C and D waste. So that one, it's really about remediation and, uh, building materials at the same time. Um, but back to the question, um, yeah, the, the, if you learn how to cultivate mushrooms, you, you basically are learning how to make these materials. Um, so there's lots and lots of stuff online from uh, different um, uh, companies. Southwest Mushrooms is a really great uh, uh, YouTube channel uh, for, for um, learning how to cultivate mushrooms, Oak and Spore um what the fungi <laughs> there's all kinds of uh you know i'm, I'm drawing a blank here but the, there, there's you know dozens at least of uh myers mushrooms uh was was one that we used a lot for um you know creating some of the equipment that we we learned how to uh cultivate with but yeah i would just um you know inspire you to to go online look at some youtube channels uh, certainly check out uh paul stamets book on uh how to uh, cultivate gourmet and medicinal mushrooms uh, that's kind of the Bible um, for for um, mushroom cultivation, but then uh, converting those materials into use, useful things uh, from the waste uh, of that. Um, there's a forum on um, Facebook called Biofabrication and uh, Mycelium Materials, um, and there's uh, several um, material uh, libraries online that I, I think uh, could be useful, and I. I I'd be willing to bet that uh, Healthy Materials Lab and um, Trace Material will have some links to to a lot of these things uh, if they if they don't already have their own forum for this. <laughs> we'll definitely. Um, I know we got a few requests. We'll definitely put together a list of links of some of these resources you mentioned and email them out to attendees. Mm -hmm. So everyone who's furiously trying to scribble that, we will, we will <laughs> get that info free. We're recording. You. There was a follow up question while you were speaking um which was just what about adding to this question what about commercial projects in urban areas um how do we mm -hmm. find more resources resources about um building in commercial and urban areas with this yeah so we're we're certainly in the process of, of scaling to that uh you know with our microhab project in namibia so that, that you know this is something that's um coming from namibia but uh, i yeah, I fully expect to have here in, um, you know, this part of the world in not too long from now. But um, there, you know, when you're talking about building, uh, especially if it's structural and things like that, you want to make sure you're working with an architect, working with engineers. So um, I don't, uh, that's not as DIY, I would say, as, you know, some of these other things where we're talking about making some, maybe some interior installation or making some art. Um, I fully recommend everyone to try that. But when it comes to um, architectural materials. There is a you know whole battery of tests that you'd have to do before you can use materials in, in any type of installation, and that's you know some of the processes that we're going through now. Um, so you know some of the processes that uh, other companies are going through and and looking at. So I I fully expect in the next five years that there there will be materials on the market that that people can use. Um, and as far as DIY processes for um, for making buildings out of, uh, that's a place to tread lightly to, to really work with uh, um, licensed professionals on, but there, there may be um, licensing uh, procedures for, for people, certification processes for people, again, another five, 10 years, I, I would say that that's probably the time frame for um, seeing that go into uh, actual buildings. Great, thank you so much. Very good distinction. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, so another question that's getting uh, a lot of love is, uh, are you aiming for mycelium to be the only building material, combining structure, insulation, and external leaf into one? And what are the current challenges and solutions? Um, yes, we are kind of aiming for this to, to, to be the, the only material or, you know, uh, sub-materials of maybe the similar kingdoms or, or you know, at least um, a fully bioterial um, building would be a, a val valid goal, I think. Um, right now, we are using it uh, in our project in Namibia for structure, insulation, uh, fire attenuation, um, uh, sound attenuation, 
all of these things. The only thing it is not is the, the exterior weather envelope. Um, and so we're building with it the same way that you would build with lumber framing uh, in, in the U.S. We commonly use, you know, two by sixes, two by fours is, is the construction material for, for building with, but that's something that needs to be weatherized because if you don't protect that, that will degrade over time. So these materials being naturally biodegradable are very useful because we can, um, you know, we have a, a way of actually disposing of them at their end of life. Um, but it becomes, you know, a bit of a liability if, if it's a material that then is degradable, that is exposed to the elements. So, well, the way we're handling that in Namibia is that the arch is put down, it's covered with a, um, a mud rendering that has lime in it. And lime is, you know, uh, kind of a good way to protect from the elements, but also to protect from vermin. Um, and uh, then even over top of that, we're putting a, a metal roof to, to kind of uh, protect that it's it's maybe overkill but you know for the first project we want to make sure that we're um you know uh, better safe than sorry so we we've uh kind of put a belt and suspenders on that project but ideally um it would be something like the the microterials would be the 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 structure and the insulation for the the project and then you would have this mud rendering could be the the finishing product or um, some other material that that's easily either discarded or reusable so that way you have a way to break down the building so if you can kind of peel off one layer and then the rest of it becomes biodegradable then we kind of uh, get back into our circular economy awesome um so i'm going to skip forward one question um these are tied but one thing that i'm specifically interested in um so can you talk a little bit about what research has been done to make sure that we are not creating new problems in, inadvertently? Um, like mm -hmm. there might be some sort of toxin or allergen that appears at a high concentration in an interior environment. Mm -hmm. um, are, we, are we making sure that you know, there's no dangerous off-gassing and that it's completely breathable in the mycelium homes? Yeah, so the, the, uh, all of the materials we're creating have to go through, you know, as I mentioned, a battery of tests and uh, those include what happens if the material does become, you know, waterlogged, and and does it produce mold? Um, uh, different different tests on what you know what happens when it burns, what what uh, material actually comes out of that. So mycelium itself is self extinguishing. So you know if we have these really thick walls made out of this this composite material, um, you know it may be like a, a you know five hour wall, which is like a really impressive uh, fire rating that, that, that you could use in any commercial building really um, but if by putting a flame to it and the smoke that comes off of that um, does off gas you know um, some poisonous material which a lot of building materials do like uh, expanded polystyrene uh, polyisocyanurate all of these uh, materials that we use for insulation they tend to really um, uh, pump out toxic gases when they burn so that they're you know, part of these fire rated assemblies, but in the, you know, um, uh, you know, in the, the way that, that the building codes are written, they're allowed to be there and they still, um, you know, produce the smoke that, that it's the, the major killer when it comes to fires is actually smoke inhalation. So, you know, we're, we're, we're uh, doing tests like that, um, you know, in addition to all of the different um, structural testing and insulation testing and things like that, all of these things need to be accounted for. But um, yeah, we're very weary of, of um, uh, you know, indoor air quality. Uh, it's a huge concern of ours uh, when, when it comes to, to making buildings. And so what we're, you know, trying to do is actually to make materials that are healthier for indoor air quality rather than um, any possibility of creating a, a, an environment for mold to, to grow. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so here's another question that I think you've, you've started to sort of cover, um, but maybe you could dig more into practically the structure's life cycle as a whole. So from growth mm -hmm. to construction to decomposition uh, at the end of its life. Okay. Yeah, so the, the, the process, um, I'll just take uh, the, 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 the mycohab in uh, Namibia for, for an example. So the process is um, the the Ministry of Agriculture is thinning the, the encroacher bush. It's, it's called Acacia mellifera. Um, and that they have over 330 million um, tons of this material that, that can be processed sustainably every 15 years. 
Um, so if we, we take that bush, which is a really thorny bush, it's, it's kind of um, really hard to deal with, put that through a chipper, um, you chip that into um, small material, and then that material is what becomes the substrate for growing mushrooms. Um, so if I take that step by step, that material is put into um, plastic uh, mushroom cultivation bags uh, with some water, um, and then the, the wa the, that bag is put into a steamer that uh, pasteurizes the material, kills off all of the organisms that are in uh, already growing on the, the wood, and then that is taken to a lab seeded with mycelium. Um, then it's taken to a fruiting chamber or to a colonization room where the mycelium grows and, and uh, basically concentrates through the substrate and then uh, it's ready to grow mushrooms. The mushrooms grow um, through small holes in the bag. The, the cultivators harvest those, they take those to market, and then what's left inside of that bag is the mycelium that's binding together that acacia millifera. So within three weeks, we're, we're growing mushrooms from, from turning that, you know, steaming that, inoculating that, putting it into a, um, a chamber. We, we're growing mushrooms in three weeks, which is a really good turnaround for, you know, a cash crop. Um, usually plants take a lot longer to grow than that. Um, from there, uh, that bag uh, can be put into our press where we uh, turn it into a brick. So the day after it, it made mushrooms, we can technically turn it into um, into blocks. Sometimes we wait longer and we have you know several fruiting cycles. Uh, if you can usually get about three fruiting cycles out of out of each bag, and you can expect the biological efficiency of for every pound of uh, material that you put into the bag, you should get that many mush that many pounds of mushrooms um, afterwards. So um, that's why we say we can get, you know, a pound of waste and a pound of material from, from, the, uh, from the process. But, you know, within three weeks, you could technically already have mushrooms and a brick um, from, from this acacia millifera, um, which is, you know, kind of doubling your, your waste resource, turning it into to really good things. Awesome, thank you. Um, you Sorry, I, let me just- to, Oh, go ahead, Virgo. I just, just cause uh, I wanna talk about end of life cycle as well. Oh, um, sure, absolutely. So so as the, at the end of life of the structure, what's right. the decomposition plan? Sorry. So the, the, yeah, the plan for that is um, usually what uh, what mushroom farmers will do with this material is they'll, they'll put that out to compost. So it co compost very well. Once we put it through the uh, press and bake it, it doesn't break down nearly as easily, but it will break down over time. Um, and so if, when we build our structures, we do it such that they're not exposed to the elements and that they're, they're good indefinitely the same way that wood is. And, you know, there's examples of, uh, you know, wood framing and, uh, Florentine uh, cathedrals that, that have been there for centuries. Um, so, you know, it's similar decomposition rate to, to that, that that could be, you know, uh, as long as you protect it, it can last forever. Uh, but if you were to bury this and similar to wood, um, that would start to decompose over time and you would actually have a compostable material. Um, and so uh, it, it'll break down a lot slower than, than the um, normal material that isn't compacted, but it does break down and, and we, we consider the material completely compostable. It's not tainted with anything else. The only thing we add to the um, process is heat and pressure. Great, thanks. Ava, next question. <laughs> um, so we have one that's also quite popular. How do you bind the blocks? Do you use mortar? Are they dry set? Um, so the, these will be dry set. We actually are uh, making them in such a way that they have um, small uh, indentations for dowels that, that will go into it. So once those dowels go in there, it's almost like Lego blocks going together. So the only thing um, are holding those together are gravity. Um, and then we're using the, the, the dowels to line them up. So it's the same way that um, old stone um, bridges were made uh, using, you know, just just the weight of the, the material. You have a keystone at the top and that, that's what kind of um, um, makes it uh, fit together. It's a perfect arch. Um, okay, so our next question uh, comes from Alex who, Chris, thanks you for such an inspiring presentation. Nice. Um, and you. then asks, uh, have you had a chance to present this to US building or code officials with an eye toward paving the way for mycelium as a building material in the wider construction industry? 
Uh, we have done very small projects here in in the states, but now we're, we're uh, mostly working in uh, Namibia now, to, and you know different parts of Africa to to proliferate this. Uh, we we absolutely plan to um, uh, do that do this in the in the states as, as time goes on the the testing mechanisms that we use are uh, ASTM international and that used to stand for American standards of testing materials so that you know the, all of the all of the uh, ASTM tests are based on what uh, American code writers uh, um, use uh, the international uh, building code is is is, is similar in um, those parts of Africa than they are uh, here in in the US so we, we are working towards those standards, but we uh, currently don't have any projects uh, in the states that that, that uh, plans to utilize this yet. Okay, um, I want to jump in again, but uh, <laughs> um, so this is, I'm going to combine two questions that are kind of similar. Um, essentially, is it possible to get rid of plastic from the manufacturing process? Um, can we grow mycelium without using plastic yes we can <laughs> um yeah we we absolutely want to right right now we are using the um uh, you know the standard uh, unicorn uh, is the company um uh, mushroom cultivation bags we are uh developing as we speak different ways of um using it'll still be plastic but it'll be reusable plastic uh forms um and so that there's a lot of reasons why we're doing that but one is to have the um um, the perfect shape for making our blocks uh, that grows from that. But um, the, the main reason is that we can use the material over and over again, um, saving a lot of waste. So it's, it's a lot of waste. It's a lot of cost. Um, and uh, obviously, you know, we, we'd like to do better by the environment if, if we can. Uh, and if we do pro proliferate such a thing, we would love to open source that and, you know, let all the mushroom cultivators use our our, our methods because uh, yeah it's 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 pretty pretty bad that uh, we have to use this disposable plastic in, in the process. Great to hear. Um, mm -hmm. So Rick asks, uh, how well does the block stand up to weather? So rain or snow? Mm -hmm. uh, we we have uh, you know done several tests on it. what what they do is they soak the block and then they do the compression tests and it, it stands up well to that. Uh, we are in the process of, of getting results on, on um, you know, ex exactly how long it takes to, to degrade the material. Um, I don't have the, the answer for that just yet, but as, as I mentioned, we are uh, always treating this the same way you would treat um, lumber and, and we protect it from the environment when, as we build. It's one of the reasons why we, we, we want to control the um, the use of the block. So, you know, we're making our blocks. We're not really selling those to, to other folks right now. We're using that for our own structures. Um, it's part of the, the testing testing process uh, to make sure that, you know, it's always detailed properly as well. Awesome. Um, okay, so next up, do you need to grow the building applied mycoterial in a controlled setting um, or can it be grown anywhere? How do you handle this in the field to prevent issues? So you, you, it's the same as mushroom cultivation. So it does have to be in a fairly uh, controlled environment. You want to uh, guard against any uh, contaminants that, that could get into the um, into the bags, into the the place where you're growing that. Um, you ha you have to have certain temperature and certain humidity to make the mushrooms grow. Um, but the mycoterial preparation happens pretty much after the mushroom cultivation for us. Um, so that that just happens in you know normal. Um, manufacturing type facilities you would take the the waste material from that and turn it into um, something immediately after it's it's been after the mushrooms have been harvested so yes you do need a controlled environment um, but it's uh, similar it's more like a mushroom farm it's more of a farm than it is a laboratory and, it, and you'll find that in a lot of monoculture farms as you really have to Kind of guard against the uh, the the, uh, the contaminants, and that goes for you know chicken farming and um, you know uh, corn farming and all of those kind of things where you you have to really be careful. But yeah, with mushroom farming, it's it's uh, it's generally indoor conditions, so you know the type of uh, 
temperature and, and moisture that you're used to, except when you get into the fruiting and then you have to increase the humidity quite a bit. Um, I'm going to skip ahead here just because this is related to something you were just talking about with, with farming here. Um, Daniela asks, how do we create ethical harvesting of said materials? Previous agricultural movements were supported by exploitation and slave labor. So how do we make sure mm. that if we scale this up, uh, that this new agricultural material manufacturing is done in an ethical way with the right stakeholders at the table? I like that question. Um, one of the things that we're doing in this is we're working with different uh, forms of food provenance. Um, and there's uh, a few companies that are using blockchain to uh, verify and uh, make transparent all of these different steps along the way. So they're going from, you know, who, who works on the farm, um, you know, to, to all of the, the different mechanisms. So from the farm to the to the uh, packaging all the way to the, to the market. Um, you get to see all of these processes and you know we're trying to develop it in such a way where you get to meet these people and if you want to leave a tip, you're, you're welcome to. Um, but uh, we're doing that for a few reasons. One is to you know, pr prove that the food is safe, that the, the workers are treated fairly. And the other one is we're uh, planning on using the same system for carbon accounting. Um, and so you can see the, 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 the way that we're um, always, uh, you know, all of the decisions are made towards um, sequestering as much carbon as possible. And th then that way that the, the um, you know, carbon can be uh, quantified and, and uh, verified in such a way that, you know, people can tr trust these claims that, you know, when you say every block uh, sequesters uh, 15 kilograms, we can prove it. And here's, here's the math behind that. And you can see that, but same thing with our, our farmers, you know, our farmers are, are, are um, you know, uh, getting li living wages. They're, they're actually very overqualified for what they're doing. They, they have uh, microbiology degrees. They have, you know, um, all, uh, you know, are very, they're, they're scientists basically because we're, you know, in this R and D phase rather than, than actually, um, you know, mostly leading to, to running a farm. So we have, um, uh, yeah, ways of actually, uh, showing that and, um, uh, um, verifying that publicly. Awesome. Okay, thank you so much. That was going to have to be our last question. We're kind of here at time now. Um, but thank you all so much for joining us and for these amazing questions. Um, this was a wonderful live taping of trace material. Uh, and thank you, Chris, for being with us and for sharing your stories and your expertise. Um, I'm definitely like totally hyped on the mycelium materials revolution at this point. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you. And if you all are also hyped on mycelium, we've got good news. We're going to dedicate the next season of Trace Material to exploring the wide world of fungi and some of the ways mycelium can define our material future. New episodes are coming in June, including the podcast episode of this talk here today. And the link uh, to previous seasons, I've just dropped that in the chat. So while you're waiting, uh, for this new season, please go back and listen. Uh, we did a deep dive into hemp and a social history of plastics. Um, a lot of that leads to this. It's, it's sort of culminating in some ways in, at mycelium. Um, so definitely go back and take a listen. Uh, and then also uh, we wanna give a shout out for the next event in this series uh, called Fashioning the Future with Carol Collette and Milo. And uh, that link is also in the chat. And uh, that'll be April 7th. So we hope to see you all there uh, for that event. Uh, so thanks again, Chris. And thank you everyone for coming. All right, have a great day, everybody. Goodbye.